In this presentation, we will be looking at intestate succession. In part one, we will look at what intestate succession is and the terminology that is used. In part two, we will look at the rules of intestate succession and we'll discuss various scenarios in order to look at how intestate succession operates. Intestate succession applies if a deceased person dies without leaving a valid will, having executed a valid will, which subsequently becomes wholly or partly inoperative, where they have a valid will which fails to dispose of all their assets, or where a deceased leaves a document purporting to be a will, but that will does not comply with the formalities as found in the Wills Act and cannot be condoned in terms of the Wills Act. With regards to customary law, the estates of all people who live according to customary law and die without a statutory will would also devolve according to the Intestate Succession Act, read with the Reform of Customary Law of Succession Act. While the Reform Act accommodates certain customary law practices, the devolution of the estate is essentially governed by the Intestate Succession Act. The order of intestate inheritance or succession is governed in terms of the Intestate Succession Act 81 of 1987. Section 1, subsection 1 of this Act sets out the provisions dealing with how a person's intestate estate is to be divided, whereas sections 1, subsection 2 to 7 deal with related provisions regarding the division of the intestate estate. When we discuss intestate succession, you will see in various textbooks that there are many terms that are used in the discussion of this concept. It is therefore important that we understand the terminology used for intestate succession. A term that you will come across in many texts is the term consanguinity. This term refers to blood relations. It refers to the bloodline of the deceased person. In intestate succession, we talk about the descendants of a deceased person. These are persons who descend directly from the deceased. Common law descendants include lineal descendants of the deceased. These would be children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. When we think of descendants, we think of a downward line, those who descend from the deceased. In customary law, descendants generally include a wider circle of descendants. In terms of Section 1 of the Reform of Customary Law of Succession Act, descendants would be a person who is a descendant in terms of the Intestate Succession Act, a person who, during the lifetime of the deceased person, was accepted by that deceased person in accordance with customary law as his or her own child. For example, any child born of a wife during a marriage are considered children of that husband, regardless of whether they are children born out of wedlock. In intestate succession, we also talk about ascendants. These are persons from whom the deceased person has descended. When we talk about ascendants of a deceased person, we are looking at the ancestors of the deceased person. In other words, we are looking at anybody in the ascending line, such as parents and grandparents. A collateral refers to a person who is related to the deceased person because he or she has the same ancestor as that deceased person. Examples of persons who would have the same ancestor can be a brother or sister, descended from both parents, a half-brother or half-sister, descended from one of the parents, a niece, nephew, cousin, uncle or aunt. Another term that you will come across often when reading on intestate succession is the term parentula. Parentula is used to describe a particular parental group and its descendants. The first parentula 
would be the deceased and his or her descendants. The second parentela would be the deceased parents and their descendants, whether related to the deceased in full or half blood. The third parentela would be the deceased grandparents and their descendants, whether related to the deceased in full or half blood. And the fourth parentela would be the deceased great grandparents and their descendants, whether related to the deceased in full or half blood. This diagram illustrates the degree of relationship in the collateral line. Each generation is a degree. A father and son would be related in the first degree. A grandfather and a grandson would be related in the second degree. If we were to look at the children of the deceased, A, B, C and D, if B was to have two children, F and G, F and G would be related to B in the first degree as a father-son relationship. F and G, however, would be related to the deceased in the second degree, as the deceased would be the grandfather of F and G. The final term that we will look at is stirps or stirpes. Here we are looking at a line of descendants of common ancestry. I like to think of stirps or stirpes as branches of a tree. These branches of a tree will include every descendant of the deceased who survives the deceased, or a predeceased descendant of the deceased who leaves living descendants. Let's look at an example of Tom in order to determine how many stirpes he has. Tom and Sally had four children, Anne, Ben, Candy and Dan. Anne, Ben and Dan predeceased Tom. Candy is the only living child. Fred is the surviving child of Anne. And Gina and Hank are the surviving children of Dan. Tom will therefore have three stirpes. The first stirpe will be Anne and Fred, as Fred will move into the place of Anne. The second stirpe will be Candy. And the third stirpe will be Dan, Gina and Hank, as Gina and Hank will move into the place of their father. Ben, who has predeceased Tom, does not count as a stirpe and has not left any descendants. Earlier on we mentioned consanguinity. In the law of intestate succession, it is not only the blood relations or bloodlines that are important, but also the degree of the consanguinity or the degree of the bloodline between the deceased and his or her intestate heirs. Each generation counts as a degree. So as we mentioned earlier, a father and son would be related to each other in the first degree, whereas a grandfather and grandson are related to each other in the second degree. So for example, A and C are related to each other in the first degree. C and M are related to each other in the second degree. And C and B are related to each other in the third degree. Let us pause now and do a quick exercise in order to look at the degrees of consanguinity. For this exercise, draw the diagram for the following facts. X dies intestate and leaves the following relatives. His wife, Y. His mother, M. His two sons, A and B. A's daughter, E. And his brother, D. Once you have drawn the diagram, answer the following questions. How many stirpes does X have? In what degree is E related to X? In what degree is D related to M? And finally, in what degree is D related to E? In drawing the diagram, you would have noticed that this would have assisted you in answering the questions. For the first question, how many stirpes that X have, the answer is two. He has a stirpe from A and a stirpe from B. For the second question, what is the degree of relationship between E and X? 
The answer to this question is a second degree relationship. For the third question, what is the degree of relationship between D and M? This is a first degree relationship. And for the final question, what is the degree of relationship between D and E? The answer to this question is a fourth degree relationship. In the law of succession, we talk of representation in both testate succession and intestate succession. In intestate succession, representation occurs where an heir of a deceased person does not take an inheritance or is unable to take an inheritance, and the inheritance is therefore taken by one of the descendants of the heir. For example, Tom dies intestate. Tom has three children, Dan, Candy and Ben. The three children would inherit equally from the deceased as the blood relations of Tom they would receive a third each. However, Ben has predeceased his father. He has two surviving descendants, Gina and Hank. They would therefore inherit by representation. They will take their father's place and they will share their father's portion of the inheritance. Gina and Hank would receive one sixth each. We have now completed part one of the intestate succession presentation and we'll now move on to looking at part two of the presentation and the rules of intestate succession. In the first scenario we will look at a situation where the deceased is survived by a spouse and not by descendants. Where the deceased is survived by one spouse, the spouse inherits the entire estate. This means that even if the deceased is survived by parents or brothers and sisters, they will not inherit. What would be the situation should this deceased have more than one spouse? Here, the estate is divided equally between the spouses. For example, should the deceased have two wives, those two wives will share the estate. For example, D dies intestate. Her son and her father have predeceased her. D is survived by her husband, her mother, and her brother. In this situation, where there is a surviving spouse and no descendants, the surviving spouse, Dee's husband, will inherit the whole estate. In scenario two, we look at a situation where the deceased is survived by descendants and not by a spouse. Where the deceased is survived by descendants and not by a spouse, the descendants will inherit the entire estate equally and representation will be used where necessary. In the law of intestate succession, we use Foote's golden rule. This rule states that the estate does not climb. We therefore try and look for the descendants to inherit. This might result in us looking at great, great, great grandchildren in order to see if they can inherit. An example scenario two is as follows. D dies intestate. His wife and one of his children have predeceased him. He is therefore survived by two children and two grandchildren. D's estate would be divided between his three children and they would receive a third each. Therefore, two of his children will inherit their third. As one of his children has predeceased him, but has left descendants, those descendants, the grandchildren of D, will, through representation, take the place of their father and inherit one sixth each. In scenario three, we have a situation where the deceased is survived by both a spouse and descendants. Where the deceased is survived by a spouse as well as descendants, the surviving spouse inherits whichever is the greater of either the children's portion or an amount fixed by the Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development. The amount is determined by the Minister in the Government Gazette. As of 24 November 2014, 
the amount is 250,000. The descendants will get the residue, if any is left, per stirpes, and representation will also be used. Section 14F of the Intestate Succession Act sets out how to calculate the child's portion. A child's portion is calculated by taking the value of the estate divided by the number of stirpes plus the spouse. This will give you the child's portion in terms of a monogamous union. In the case of polygamy, one counts the number of stirpes plus the number of spouses. Each spouse is entitled to 250,000 or the child's portion, whichever is greater. When we're dealing with a situation where we have a surviving spouse and descendants, it is important that we keep the matrimonial property regime in mind. The share inherited by a surviving spouse is unaffected by any amount to which he or she might be entitled to in terms of the matrimonial property laws. Where a spouse is married in community of property or under the accrual system, the surviving spouse's share of the joint estate or the accrual share does not form part of the intestate estate of the deceased. The amount to which the surviving spouse is entitled to in terms of the applicable marital property regime is deducted first. The balance or the remaining amount of the intestate estate after all liabilities are paid is then distributed between the surviving spouse and the descendants. The same would be happen if the spouse had an antinuptial contract with testamentary provisions. Let's look at an example where the deceased is married in community of property. Sapiwe and patients are married in community of property and their joint estate at the time of Sapiwe's death is 800,000. We therefore need to first calculate what Sapiwe's estate is. We will therefore divide the joint estate in half. Sapiwe's estate is worth 400,000 rand. We then need to calculate the child's portion. We will take 400,000 rand and divide it by patients and the three children. We will then notice that 100,000 rand is less than the 250,000 rand amount set in the Government Gazette. Patients will therefore get 250,000. We then need to calculate what the descendants will receive. We will therefore need to work out what the residue of the estate is. The residue is 150,000. Therefore, the descendants of the deceased, A, B and C, will receive 50,000 rand each. Should one of them have predeceased the deceased and left their descendants, then those descendants will receive 25,000 rand each. When we are dealing with an estate where the spouses were married out of community property with a cruel, there are certain steps that must be followed in order to determine the estate of the deceased so that we can determine what each beneficiary will receive. The steps that you will need to follow are listed on this slide. Let's look at an example of Kerry's estate. Kerry was married to Stefan out of community of property but subject to the accrual system. Kerry is survived by the following persons. Her husband Stefan, a son Peter, born of the previous marriage between Kerry and Llewellyn, two grandsons, Mark and Tom, the sons of Peter, an adopted son, David, her mother, Miriam, and her sister, Nancy. In this example, it is necessary to calculate Kerry's intestate estate. Kerry's estate is worth 300,000 rand at the time of her death. Stefan's is worth 2 million rand. At the commencement of their marriage, Kerry's estate was worth 20,000 rand, and Stefan's estate was worth 40,000 rand. During their marriage, Stefan inherited 100,000 rand from an aunt and Kerry obtained 5,000 rand in a defamation suit. We are also provided with the consumer price index, which is important for our calculations. Following steps one to three, we'll be able to calculate the amounts of both Kerry and Stefan, which should give us the amount for the accrual. In calculating the accrual, we would have noticed that Kerry is entitled to an amount from Stefan's estate. Therefore, Kerry's net estate is worth 1,086,830 rand.
it is not necessary to calculate what each person will receive from Carrie's estate. First, we need to calculate the child's portion. In doing so, we will notice that the child's portion is greater than 250,000. Therefore, Stefan will receive this child's portion. It is now necessary to calculate the residue of the estate. Once we've calculated the residue, this amount will be divided equally between her descendants. Therefore, both David and Peter will receive equal amounts from the estate. Where we are dealing with a situation where the spouses are married out of community property without accrual, there is no need to calculate an adjustment. Therefore, in this example, we are dealing with an estate where Anthony and his wife were married out of community property without accrual. Anthony's estate is worth 1.4 million. We therefore need to calculate what his wife and his descendants will receive. We therefore need to take 1.4 million and divide it by the spouse and any surviving descendants. This equals 350,000. This amount is greater than the government's gazette amount of 250,000. Therefore, Anthony's wife will receive 350,000. Once we have made this calculation, it is necessary to look at what the descendants will receive from the residue of the estate. We will therefore take the residue of the estate and divide it by the descendants. In terms of this calculation, the three descendants will receive 350,000 rand each. Should one of them have predeceased the deceased, then those descendants will receive a por their portion, and in this case, it would be 175,000 rand each. In scenario 4, we have a situation where the deceased is not survived by a spouse or descendants, but is survived by both parents. Where the deceased leaves no spouse or descendants, but is survived by both parents, those parents will inherit in equal shares. The parents can be biological, adoptive or commissioning parents in a surrogacy arrangement. If both parents of the deceased are alive, all other collateral relations of the deceased, such as a brother or a sister, are excluded from inheriting. In this example, the deceased wife has predeceased him. He is survived by his mother, his father, and his sister. His mother and father will therefore inherit his estate in equal shares, as he does not have a spouse or descendants. In scenario 5, the deceased is not survived by a spouse or descendants, but is survived by one parent and descendants of a predeceased parent. When the deceased is survived by no spouse or descendants, but by one parent and the descendants of a predeceased parent, that surviving parent inherits one half of the intestate estate, and the descendants of the deceased parent will inherit the other half. Division amongst these descendants will take place per stirpes and representation is allowed. It does not matter whether the, de the descendants of the predeceased parent are related to the deceased in half or full blood. If the predeceased parent has no descendants, then the surviving parent will inherit the entire estate. In this example, the deceased spouse and father have predeceased him. He is therefore survived by his mother, his sister, and his half-brother. Therefore, his estate will be divided between his mother, the surviving parent, and his father's descendants. His mother will therefore receive 50% of the estate. The father's share will be divided equally between A and S. In scenario 6, we look at a situation where the deceased is not survived by a spouse, descendants or parents, but is survived by descendants of the predeceased parents. Where the deceased is not survived by a spouse, descendants or parents, but is survived by descendants of his or her parents, the estate is divided into two equal halves, with each share going to the side of one of the deceased parents. From there, one half goes to the descendants of the deceased father by representation per stirpes, 
and the other half goes to the descendants of the deceased mother by representation per stirpes. Full brothers and sisters of the deceased will share from both halves. Half brothers and sisters will take a share from the half of the estate through that parent that they are related to. Let's look at an example where we have descendants who are only related to one parent. D's estate is worth a hundred thousand. D's mother and father predecease him. He is survived by his half sister A on his mother's side and his half sister S on his father's side. Each parent would therefore get 50,000 Rand. As they have predeceased the D, A will inherit the mother's portion through representation, and S will inherit the father's portion through representation. Should A have also predeceased D, then her portion will be divided amongst her children through representation. In this scenario, D has both full and half blood siblings. D's mother, father, and half-blood brother, A, predecease him. D is survived by his full-blood sister, B, his half-blood sister, F, on his father's side, and E and F, the children of the predeceased, A. D's estate will be divided between his mother and father. His mother's share will be divided between her descendants. Therefore, her money will be divided between B as well as the children of A. B will therefore receive 20,000 Rand from the mother and E and F will receive 12,500 Rand each. The father's portion will be divided amongst his descendants. His descendants are B and S. Therefore, B will also receive 25,000 Rand from the father and S will receive 25,000 Rand. Scenario 7, the deceased is survived by descendants of one parent only. Where the deceased is only survived by the descendant of one parent, then that descendant will be his sole heir. For example, D dies in test 8. D's brother, mother and father have predeceased her. She is survived by her half-brother S from her father's side. S will therefore inherit the entire estate. In scenario 8, the deceased is not survived by a spouse, descendants, parents, or descendants of the parents, but by blood relations in the third and further parentula. Where the deceased is not survived by a spouse, descendants, or descendants of the parents, the nearest blood relations will inherit. This is where the degree of consanguinity is important. The estate will be divided equally amongst those relations who are most closely related to the deceased. In the third and further parentula, the estate is not divided by stirpes and representation is not allowed. Division takes place per capita according to the principle that the nearest blood relation inherits the estate. It is therefore necessary to work out the degrees of the relationship to see who is more closely related to the deceased. In the direct line, it is necessary to count the number of generations between the person who qualifies to inherit and the deceased. In the collateral line, one must first find the common ancestor of both the deceased and the person who qualifies to inherit. Then it is necessary to count the number of generations between the common ancestor and the deceased, plus the number of degrees between the common ancestor and the person who qualifies to inherit. Let's look at an example. D dies in test eight and is only survived by a second cousin, a cousin and an aunt. It is therefore necessary to calculate who is closest in blood to the deceased. If we are to look at parentula, there is no one surviving the first or second parentula. However, in the third parentula, we have an aunt who is surviving. When we look at the degrees of consanguinity, the second cousin, is related to the deceased in five degrees. The cousin is related to the deceased in four degrees and the aunt is related to the deceased in three degrees. Therefore, the deceased aunt 
is his closest relation and therefore inherit the whole estate. In the final scenario, we have a situation where no intestate relation can be found, or they are determinable but nobody comes forward. Here, where the person dies intestate without having anyone who could inherit his estate, the estate is forfeited to the state after 30 years from the date when the person became entitled to the money. Section 3513 of the Administration of Estates Act stipulates that the executor of the estate has to pay to the master of the High Court a deposit into the Guardian's Fund on behalf of the persons entitled thereto any monies which he has, for any reason, been unable to distribute in terms of the liquidation and distribution account. In terms of Section 92, the money in the Guardian's Fund that has not been claimed in 30 years will be forfeited to the state. Now that we've looked at the scenarios which deal with the rules governing intestate succession, it is necessary to also consider briefly renunciation, repudiation and disqualification. In some instances, an heir may choose to renounce or repudiate a benefit. In other instances, an heir may be disqualified from inheriting. In terms of Section 17 of the Intestate Succession Act, if a person is disqualified from being an intestate heir, or repudiates or renounces an inheritance, that benefit that he or she would have received will devolve as if he or she had died before the deceased. If the disqualified or repudiating heir has descendants, those descendants will inherit through representation. If the disqualified or repudiating heir has no descendants, then their share which they would have received will go to other heirs of the deceased according to the normal principles of intestate succession. It is important to note that where an heir repudiates an inheritance, we must apply section 17 in conjunction with 16. This means that if an intestate heir of the deceased repudiates an inheritance and the deceased is survived by a spouse, the surviving spouse will inherit the repudiating heir's share. However, if the deceased is not survived by a spouse, then the repudiating heir will be deemed to have predeceased the deceased and his descendants will inherit through representation. If there are no descendants, then the inheritance will go to the other heirs. It is clear from the wording of section 16 that this does not apply to heirs who have been disqualified. If an heir has been disqualified, that person's heirs will inherit and not the surviving spouse. If there are no descendants, then the inheritance will go to the other heirs. Let's look at an example of where an heir repudiates their benefit. John and William entered into a civil union in terms of the Civil Union Act. John dies in test and leaves the following relatives. William, his spouse, who is also entitled to 100,000 rand accrual. Samuel and Dina, with John and William's adopted children, Franz, John's grandson, Mary, John's mother, and Ben, John's brother. He also leaves behind his ex-wife, Kathy. When the estate is liquidated, Dina refuses to inherit any part of John's estate. She wishes to repudiate her share. John's estate is worth 950,000. We therefore need to first minus the accrual in order to work out what his final estate is. John's final estate will be 850,000. It is then necessary to calculate the child's portion in order to determine what William will receive. We therefore take 850,000 and divide it between the spouse plus the descendants. The amount is therefore 212,500. This is less than the 250,000 in the Government Gazette. William has therefore received the greater of the amounts. William will therefore receive 250,000. We then need to calculate the residue of the estate. The residue is 600,000. This will be shared amongst the descendants. Sam will therefore receive 200,000. France will receive 200,000 through representation, 
and Dina would receive 200,000. However, Dina has repudiated her share. Therefore, according to section 17, 16 of the Intestate Succession Act, Dina's share will go to the surviving spouse, William. William will therefore receive his 250,000 plus the 200,000 which Dina has repudiated. We have come to the end of our presentation on intestate succession. We hope that you have found this presentation helpful in determining what intestate succession is and how the various rules of intestate succession operate. We wish you all the best for your further studies in the law of succession.